Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Heidi who lived with her aunt in the Alps, the highest mountains in Switzerland. One day, her aunt Diet decided that Heidi should go and live with her grandfather, even higher up in the Alps mountains. Heidi's grandfather was known by everyone as a grumpy old man. Hey, when Aunt Diet and Heidi arrived, he was not happy when he learned Heidi had come to live with him. Heidi was such a cheerful girl who loved being in the mountains with her grandpa. Oh, no. She did not even notice how cranky he was. After a short while, Grandpa really began to enjoy Heidi's company. They grew very attached to each other. Heidi loved to help her grandpa, and she really enjoyed the mountain scenery and fresh air. She made friends with the local goat herd, Peter. They had so much fun playing with goats and running through the mountain meadows. One day, Aunt Diet returned to tell Heidi it was time to go to school in Frankfurt. She would live with the Sussman family and their daughter, Clara. Heidi and her grandpa were very sad to say goodbye as she left for the big city of Frankfurt. When Heidi arrived in Frankfurt, she was taken aback by all the hustle and bustle of the big city. Heidi met the Sessman's governess and their daughter, Clara. <gasps> Clara was confined to a wheelchair, as she had been sick and her legs were not working properly. She was very excited to meet Heidi. The two girls became great friends. Heidi would sometimes play a little too wildly for the governess. The governess became very strict with Heidi. Heidi was sad. She was not used to city life, let alone being indoors so much. She felt trapped in the city and longed for her grandpa and their happy life in the mountains. The governess called Aunt Diet and explained how she was worried about Heidi. Aunt Diet came and took Heidi to the doctor. The doctor told Aunt Diet, Heidi needs to return to the mountains and she will feel much better. Heidi was so excited when she heard the news. She told Clara how much she would miss her and then Aunt Diet took her to see her grandpa. When Heidi arrived at her grandpa's, they were so happy to see each other. <laughs> Heidi immediately felt so much better. She called Clara to say she missed her, but she was also feeling so much better being back in the mountains. Clara asked her parents if she could visit Heidi. They said yes. Clara's parents also hoped the fresh mountain air would make Clara feel a little better. Clara arrived and played with Peter and Heidi. Clara loved the mountains and the fresh air and the goats. And she also began to feel so much better. One day, Clara thought she might try to walk. And it was a miracle. She actually was able to get out of her wheelchair and take some steps. When Clara's parents came back to pick up Clara, they could not believe their eyes when they saw Clara walking. But where is her wheelchair? asked Clara's mother. Peter admitted he had an accident. The wheelchair was now broken. Peter said how sorry he was but Clara and her mother forgave him. You helped me learn how to walk, Peter, said Clara. And for that, I am forever grateful. It was now time for Clara to return to the city. 
They all hugged and promised to remain friends forever. Grandpa declared Clara's miraculous recovery to be a miracle of the Alps mountains and true friendship. Everyone lived happily ever after, exchanging city and mountain visits forever. Once upon a time in the city of Paris, a young man lived in the bell tower of the Notre Dame Cathedral. He was strong enough to ring the church bells. He was also very gentle, gentle enough to hold small birds in his hands. His only friends were the gargoyles. They did not mind that he had a hunchback and a face so ugly that his evil, cruel master named him Quasimodo, which means half-formed. Quasimodo knew nothing of the world below him. He only knew what his master told him. His master even taught Quasimodo to think of himself as a monster. Quasimodo wanted to join the crowds below him on the streets of Paris so bad, but his master would never let him leave. Quasimodo spent his days carving small wooden figures, wishing he could see the whole world below. Once a year, Paris celebrated the Festival of Fools. The gargoyles convinced Quasimodo to climb down the tower and attend the festival. Everyone wore masks at the festival, so no one would pay attention to Quasimodo's looks. Quasimodo went to the festival and saw the most beautiful gypsy dancer, Esmeralda. The master's newest soldier, Captain Phoebus, saw Esmeralda and also thought she was the most beautiful. All of a sudden, the crowd grabbed Quasimodo and made him king of fools, until they found out his face was not a mask. He was a monster. They tied him down with ropes so he could not escape. Quasimodo begged his master for help, but he refused. All of a sudden, the beautiful gypsy Esmeralda cut Quasimodo free and yelled at his master. You mistreat Quasimodo like you mistreat my people, Esmeralda said. You will pay for this, yelled the master, and he ordered his new Captain Phoebus to arrest her. Esmeralda snuck away into the cathedral with her goat. Captain Phoebus found her there and did not want to arrest her. He told her she could claim sanctuary as long as she stayed inside the church. If she sets one foot outside this church, she will be my prisoner, said the cruel master. Quasimodo and Esmeralda became great friends. Quasimodo was confused because the master had told him how bad gypsies were. But Esmeralda was kind and good. And she did not think Quasimodo was a monster at all. I think the master is wrong about both of us, said Esmeralda. Quasimodo helped her plan her escape. Quasimodo carried Esmeralda and her goat down the church walls to the street one night. She gave Quasimodo a special amulet and said, Use this if you ever need help. It will show you how to find the Court of Miracles, the secret gypsy hideout. She promised she would visit Quasimodo again and kissed him on the cheek. <laughs> when Esmeralda returned, she brought Captain Phoebus, who had been badly wounded. The master attacked us, and Captain Phoebus tried to help. Please help him get well. Quasimodo agreed and hid the captain in the bell tower. The master still wanted to find the gypsies and thought Quasimodo might know where to find them all in their secret hideaway. The master tricked Quasimodo and told him he knew where the secret hideaway was and he would attack the gypsies at dawn with 1,000 of his soldiers. This was just a trick by the cruel master. Quasimodo and Captain Phoebus decided they must use the special amulet to find Esmeralda and warn her. They secretly made their way to the Court of Miracles, but they had no idea the master and his soldiers were secretly following them. Quasimodo and Captain Phoebus led them to the secret gypsy hiding place. Take them all away, the cruel master yelled to his soldiers. No, please, begged Quasimodo. But the master had a heart of stone. The next day, the master had chained up Quasimodo in the bell tower and was going to punish Esmeralda in the courtyard below. 
Quasimodo broke his chains and rescued Esmeralda and brought her to safety in the bell tower. The master tried to break into the tower with his soldiers, but the gargoyles beat the master and his men. At last, the master's evil reign was over. The people of Paris cheered. Hip, hip, hooray for Quasimodo. Finally, Quasimodo understood he was not a monster at all. But to the people of Paris, he was a great hero. Simba the lion carried a heavy burden for such a young lion, as he thought he was responsible for the death of his father. His meerkat, warthog, and other animal friends wanted to help Simba laugh again. You must put the past behind you, they all told him. Hakuna Matata. Hakuna Matata means no worries, they told Simba. Soon Simba felt much better as he joined his animal friends. swimming in the river and enjoying nice long days. As long as Simba did not think about his father's death and the painful memory of his uncle Scar, telling Simba that he was responsible for his father's death. Scar had told Simba to run away. Simba felt like he was always running away. One day, while playing, a beautiful lioness chased Simba's friend, the warthog. She wanted to eat him. The warthog was very scared. Simba saved his warthog friend and then realized the lioness was his old best friend from childhood, hey. Nala. Simba had run away from his pride land so long ago. Nala and all the lions and all the other animals missed him very much and she told them they needed Simba to save them from Scar and the hyenas. They were destroying the Pride Lands. Please come home, asked Nala. You are our only hope. Simba was not yet ready to return, and he sat and talked to Nala all night, and they kissed and had a private embrace. You can't change the past. It's all my fault, said Simba as he walked away from Nala. Close by, a wise baboon called out to Simba. You're Mufasa's son, he reminded Simba. He lives in you, said the old baboon, and he reminded Simba of that. The baboon led Simba to a pool of water and told him to stare hard at his reflection. Suddenly, the clouds parted and the water changed shape, and Simba saw his father, Mufasa, Remember who you are, Mufasa said from the stars. You are my son and the one true king. Simba was afraid of what he knew he must do. The baboon all of a sudden hit Simba with a stick. Why did you do that? It hurt, asked Simba. Doesn't matter, it's in the past, said the baboon as he tried to hit Simba again. Simba ducked, avoiding the hit. See, said the baboon, the past can hurt, but you can either learn from it or run away. Simba understood this lesson and decided to return to his father's land to save it from the hyenas and challenge his uncle Scar. I must fight for this or who will? We will, answered Nala, the warthog, baboon and meerkat. We are with you until the end. They followed Simba to the Pride Lands and fought a big battle with the hyenas. Simba fought his evil Uncle Scar. Scar admitted, I killed your father, Mufasa. When Simba heard this, a great anger surged through him. Anger for the death of his father. Anger for years of guilt. 
anger for the destruction of his home, the pride lands. With a great roar, Simba flipped his uncle over the rock. Scar was defeated. Simba roared and finally claimed his rightful place as king. Nala was waiting for him and told all the animals that Simba was now king of the land. As news of Simba's return spread across the vast land, all of the animals once again roamed free. The land began to heal, and Simba and Nala ruled as king and queen. Simba and Nala started their own family and lived happily ever after. Long ago in a small village, a woodcarver named Geppetto made a wooden puppet. It looked so much like a real boy that Geppetto gave it a name, Pinocchio. The old man was so happy, he showed the puppet to his cat Figaro and his goldfish Cleo. As Geppetto showed his puppet to his dear pets, a small cricket named Jiminy Cricket snuck into Geppetto's house to have a warm night's sleep. Jiminy Cricket watched as Geppetto set the puppet down and gazed out the window at the stars. Look at that! The wishing star! Geppetto cried. Geppetto wished Pinocchio was a real boy. Soon it was bedtime and Geppetto, Figaro, Cleo and Jiminy Cricket all fell asleep. Before long, a beautiful light filled the workshop and woke up Jiminy Cricket. It was the Blue Fairy. She had heard Geppetto's wish and was there to make Pinocchio a real boy. She touched the puppet with her magic wand and Pinocchio came to life. But Pinocchio had to prove he was brave, truthful, and unselfish to become a real boy. The Blue Fairy knew Pinocchio would need help, so she made Jiminy Cricket his helper, so he would help him to choose between right and wrong and prove himself. Geppetto was delighted with Pinocchio, and he sent him off to school like a good parent. On the way to school, Pinocchio met a sly fox, who said Pinocchio could make a lot of money and didn't have to go to school. Jiminy Cricket didn't trust the sly fox. The sly fox said he could spend all of his time having fun in the theater instead of studying at school. Pinocchio said, okay, and off he went with the sly fox to the theater owner. That night, the theater owner put Pinocchio on stage. He was a big hit as he sang and danced for the crowd. The crowd threw money on the stage. Jiminy Cricket, who was in the crowd, worried. After the show, the theater owner locked Pinocchio up and said, you will live here and make me lots of money. Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket wondered how he could escape. Luckily, the Blue Fairy arrived. She asked Pinocchio why he missed school. He lied. She asked him more questions, and each time he told a lie, his nose grew longer and longer. The Blue Fairy reminded him to tell the truth if he wanted to be a real boy. Pinocchio promised he would tell the truth. She fixed his nose and set him free. The next day, Pinocchio met the Sly Fox again. The Sly Fox convinced Pinocchio to not go to school but instead play and have fun all day. Pinocchio followed the fox, not returning home after regular school time. Geppetto was worried and went to look for Pinocchio. Geppetto sailed his boat to search for Pinocchio and he was swallowed up by a huge whale. When Pinocchio returned home from playing all day, he found this out and he knew he must save Geppetto. Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket found the huge whale and they teased him with the fish. The whale grabbed the fish, the pole, Pinocchio and Jiminy Cricket and they were all swallowed into his belly. They found Geppetto in the whale's belly too. They must find a way to escape from the whale. 
They decided they would make the whale sneeze, and they would all escape when the whale opened his mouth. It worked, but when the whale saw them in the water, he thrashed around, knocking everyone about. Pinocchio had to grab Geppetto to save him. After a while, the water settled down and Geppetto and Jiminy Cricket awoke on the beach. They found Pinocchio lying lifeless on the rocks. Geppetto was heartbroken and he carried his son home in his arms, convinced he had lost Pinocchio forever. Back in the workshop, Geppetto and Jiminy Cricket cried and then all of a sudden, the blue fairy appeared. She touched her wand on Pinocchio and said, Awake! Pinocchio awoke, and the Blue Fairy said, By saving Geppetto, you have proven yourself to be brave, truthful, and unselfish. I am a real boy, shouted Pinocchio. Pinocchio, Geppetto, Jiminy Cricket, and all the pets celebrated and danced as Geppetto's wish had come true. Pinocchio was a real boy.